everyone. We've nearly made it to the end of the day in Tux Theater, but we're ending with the wonderful Kathy Reed. Um, I will tell you a little bit about her. Kathy Reed works at the intersection of open source, emerging technologies, and the communities that bring them to life. She has 20 years experience in development, developer and technical leadership, and management roles across education and emerging technology. She is currently with Mozilla's voice team and is doing a PhD with ANU's 3A Institute on how open voice technology goes to scale. So Kathy will be taking questions at the end if there is time, which we expect there will be. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat in Venulus uh, where you're watching. Uh, and please preface your question with the word question so that we can find the questions at the end. Welcome, Kathy, and take it away. Thank you so much for the introduction, Betsy. Uh, I'm Kathy Reed, and as Betsy, Betsy mentioned, I'm currently a PhD candidate at the 3A Institute at the Australian National University, and also a part-time member of Mozilla's product operations team. I have a background in open source systems, and in recent years, I've specialized in voice and voice assistance. There are three things I'd like to do today before starting the talk proper. First, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm broadcasting today from the traditional lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people in Canberra, and I pay my respects to elders past and present and to leaders emerging, and I recognise that the lands we are on were never ceded. Secondly, I'd like to acknowledge that Linux Confeu is a community-produced event, and I'd like to recognise the organisers and volunteers for their time and their labour. Without you, this conference wouldn't happen. Thank you. And importantly, please be aware that I'll be using wake words in this presentation. They might activate your voice assistant. So you may wish to mute your voice assistant or put your phone out of earshot for this presentation. The key argument I'll be making today is very simple. Voice technologies and their underlying components, algorithms, hardware, data, and so on, have evolved over the last 70 years or so and are becoming ubiquitous, widely adopted in a range of contexts. That is, we have more voice. At the same time, the turn to machine learning and the huge volumes of data required to produce artifacts like speech recognition models create both huge barriers to entry to voice technology, and those companies that can overcome this barrier generally optimise their activities for profit. In the voice space, this often means orienting towards affluent market segments, which are predominantly Western and white. This limits the choice that people around the world have in using voice technologies. That is, we have more voice, but less choice. Voice technologies aren't new. We've wanted machines to understand our voices and act upon them for decades. This desire echoes both in our cultural imaginary and in the enormous effort we've invested in voice and speech recognition technologies over the last century. In the cultural imaginary, the way our voices are recognised, understood and responded to ranges from the helpful, think of computer on Star Trek, to the sarcastic, think of Kit of Knight Rider fame, to the downright creepy, so think of Howl in 2001, A Space Odyssey. So our imaginary, our speculative fiction has provided inspiration and aspiration for how we might approach building voice technologies and what to avoid. <laughs> no one really wants Howl as a voice assistant. The reality of how speech recognition and voice synthesis has developed is a lot less glamorous and a lot more incremental. Let's take a look. There are many possible starting points for this narrative. I could start with was just start here by saying I wasn't quite sure where I'm going to start this talk. I could start in the fourth century in India where we looked at the phonemes of Indian language. I could start the talk in the mid 1700s with Irishman Thomas Sheridan and his desire to elevate the practice of rhetoric and public speaking in Britain and ensure people could articulate and enunciate. In 1780, Sheridan even published a dictionary, which was one of the first attempts to standardise pronunciation of English. 
That is, he was seeking to reduce the diversity of accents. And you'll see why this is important, even with the advances we've made in speech recognition to date. I could also start with Christian Gottlieb Kratzenstein. Kratzenstein was born in Germany in 1723, and he was a polymath. His early work was in electrotherapy, the therapeutic uses of electricity, and he was a professor of mathematics and mechanics at the St. Petersburg Academy of Sciences. In 1780, about the same time that Sheridan was publishing his Dictionary of English Pronunciation, Kratzenstein encountered a scientific competition convened by the Academy to find out the difference between the vowel sounds A, E, I, O and U and to see if they could be produced by a musical instrument. So you can see where this is going. This is one of the earliest attempts to synthesise the human voice by understanding more about the different sounds the voice is capable of making. And of course, you can guess the outcome. Kratzenstein won the competition and the image that you can see here is his vowel resonator. He had several similar designs of this resonator where the shape varied to produce a different vowel sound. But I'm not going to start with Paranini or with Sheridan or with Kratzenstein. I'd like to start this story instead in August 1956 at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire in the United States. There at the Dartmouth conference gathered Claude Shannon, the father of information theory, and many of you listening today will be familiar with his work, Marvin Minsky, founder of the MIT Artificial Intelligence Lab, and who did groundbreaking work with models of artificial intelligence using agents. Nathaniel Rochester, who designed the IBM 701 and wrote the first assembler language. And John McCarthy, who developed the programming language LISP and pioneered garbage collection, a process used to automatically reclaim available memory on a system. So, you know, minor players in the history of computer science. And the reason I think the Dartmouth Conference in 1956 is an excellent starting point for talking about the rise and ubiquity of voice technologies is the aspirational message it conveyed. An attempt will be made to find how to make machines use language. What the folks at Dartmouth College were doing was making a deliberate choice to apply the new advances of the time in computing and information theory to the areas of natural language. This wasn't altruistic in any way. Dartmouth occurred against the backdrop of the Cold War and the technological rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union. Machines that could speak and be spoken to provided a strategic advantage and the attendees at Dartmouth were particularly interested in machine translation, automatically translating from one language, say Russian, into another one. English. Making machines use language, however, took a lot longer than just one summer. So what happened after Dartmouth? One of the first attempts at speech recognition was the shoebox, developed in the early 1960s by William C. Dirsch at the Advanced Systems Development Division at IBM. It had some limited speech recognition capabilities. It was able to recognise 16 spoken words like sum or multiply and the digits naught through nine. So it operated on what we call in speech recognition as a limited vocabulary. And the way it recognised words was fascinating in its simplicity. The shoebox broke down the parts of each of the 16 words into a beginning sound, a middle sound and an ending sound. For example, the number eight when we say it has an open sound to start with, the A sound, and then the sound is closed or stopped, the T part of the sound. In linguistics, this is called a plosive sound, and it sounds very different to say the number seven, seven. It's a hard S sound called a fricative, followed by the softer V and N. You can hear that it has three building blocks or phonemes instead of the two of the number eight, so the shoebox was rule-based and it determined the word, remember it could recognise 16 words, based on the combination of rules. So if you have an open sound and a plosive sound, you get an eight. And if you have a fricative sound and two soft sounds, you get a seven and so on. 
and the demonstrations of the shoebox can still be found on YouTube. And I encourage you to watch them. They're fascinating. If you listen closely to William as he's speaking to the shoebox, which is connected to an adding machine, you'll hear that he's very clearly enunciating the words. The syllables are quite differentiated, like total for total and so on, and that he's speaking very slowly, not at the normal prosody or rate of speech that we would normally talk with. And that's because the hardware of the time, this was the early 1960s, wasn't particularly powerful. Keep in mind that eight years later, the Apollo 11 mission went to the moon with the Apollo guidance computer. And that computer was about 120 million times less powerful than the mobile phone you have in your pocket. So to be able to have a speech recognition system that operated, albeit slowly, on a limited vocabulary in a single language, and which actuated or controlled an adding machine was still a remarkable feat for its time. About 15 years later at Carnegie Mellon, Bruce Loweri developed the Harpy speech recognition system. Instead of the 16 or so words and commands that Shoebox could recognise, Harpy could recognise over a thousand words. And when Shoebox was trained on just one speaker, Harpy attempted to be more generalised. It was trained on four different speakers. Harpy also used a different type of algorithmic approach to speech recognition. Instead of the rule-based approach of the shoebox, Harvey used an early form of neural network called a perceptron. This required a huge number of calculations. And if you read Lawari's thesis, which is publicly available, um, you'll be very impressed by some of the techniques that are used. This is in 1976 for reducing the amount of computation that's needed. For example, the size of the perceptron the number of connections between nodes and the number of possible outputs is reduced in various ways to reduce the time it takes to identify a word from audio input. The search space is reduced. And if you're wondering about how much computation was needed for Harpy, well, once it was trained, it could do inference, the, the speech recognition part, on a PDP-10 machine, one of these. At somewhere between 13 to 18 times real time, that is, if you spoke a phrase or an utterance that lasted, say, 10 seconds, it would take about two to three minutes to be able to recognise that utterance and come back with the transcription. It's hard to imagine talking to your voice assistant today and waiting for two or three minutes for a response to come back, isn't it? But what about voice synthesis? Advances were being made in this field in the 1970s as well. Rather than the analogue instrumental synthesis that Kratzenstein had experimented with in the 1700s, the advance of integrated circuits meant that voice synthesis was done in silicon. Texas Instruments were pioneers here, and in the late 1970s they released a series of chips that were specifically designed for speech synthesis. And uh, if you're an arcade games fan, you often find them in arcade games of that era as well. They used a technique called linear predictive coding. And this is a technique that goes right back to the 1940s. And it was pioneered by Norbert Wiener, the father of cybernetics, for detecting signals hidden in noise. Linear predictive coding distinguishes the sounds that are produced by the human voice, think of fricatives and plosives, into formants and each formant has a particular type of audio wave shape. And then it uses these patterns, these formants, to synthesize sound. And if some of you are <clears throat> my vintage, you'll remember this device, the Speak and Spell, which used one of Texas Instruments' linear predictive coding chips. In fact, if you used a GSM mobile phone in the 2000s, it still used a very similar algorithm to compress speech for transmission over narrow bandwidth networks, like mobile networks, or, you know, the MBN. If we move forward to the 1980s, jumping ahead just four years, we can start to see the advancement of voice technologies accelerating even further. In 1980, IBM developed the Tangora, which wasn't so much a talking typewriter as a listening typewriter, a typewriter that was actuated by a voice in a similar way that William C. Dersh's shoebox actuated the adding machine. 
The Tangora, based on an IBM ATPC, that's right, we see here a scaling down from the PDP-10 mainframe to a desktop personal computer. The Tangora ran on a PC and could recognize a 20,000 word vocabulary. So 20 times that of the Harpy that ran on a PDP-10. In order to achieve this, the Tangora took advantage of both the faster hardware as well as a new algorithmic approach. It used hidden Markov models. Hidden Markov models are a statistical model that can predict output probabilities based on observations. And in the case of the speech, in the case of speech recognition, this means predicting what phoneme is being said, what building block of speech from, a, from an observable signal, which in the case of speech recognition is the recorded speech, the audio signal. And hidden Markov models are still used today in speech recognition. If we move to the 1990s and 2000s, we start to see the emergence of open source speech recognition and voice synthesis tools that are widely applicable, not just prototypes or lab specimens. Initially, these were born from research communities. For example, the Sphinx open source speech recognition engine was pioneered at Carnegie Mellon. The Julia speech recognition came out of Kyoto University and the Nagoya Institute of Technology. Coldy came much later and originally started at Johns Hopkins, although its stewardship has changed over the years. On the voice synthesis side, the text-to-speech side, we also see the emergence of widely applicable open source tools. And these two tended to be born from research projects. For example, the festival suite of voice synthesis tools was developed at the University of, Ed of Edinburgh in the late 1990s. Mary TTS was also a research collaboration between the Institute of Phonetics at Saarland University and the German Research Centre for Artificial Intelligence. Mary TTS also supports several languages, mostly Western and Central European. eSpeak is the exception here. It was released in 1995 by an open source developer and was rewritten in the early 2010s, and it supports over 126 languages. And what we see through the 1990s and the 2000s is a continued acceleration along the previous axes, faster hardware with more capacity for large scale data processing, the use of more sophisticated algorithms. For example, on the voice synthesis side, we start to see the use of concatenative approaches. If we remember the spell and speak, <laughs> those of you my age probably do, we know that it used linear predictive coding to try and simulate the sounds of the human voice. In text-to-speech, speech synthesis, concatenative approaches take recordings of speech and break them up into phonemes, the building blocks of sound, and then stitch them together. Additionally, we see two other factors start to come through. Research is occurring in universities rather than in corporations or industrial firms. Remember that Shoebox and Tangora came out of IBM and Speak and Spell came out of Texas Instruments. And we also see the rise of open source communities around these products. These communities provided additional functionality, such as support for more languages, or in the case of eSpeak, continuity on the project when the maintainer stepped down. And as we move into the 2010s, the drivers of advancement shift again. We see the inception of hardware specifically designed to do the vol huge volumes of calculations required by machine learning algorithms. Think tensor processing units. The image there is one of Google's TPUs and that's designed specifically to work with TensorFlow. And again, we've seen the rise of both new algorithms. Think of WaveNet or Tachytron in the speech synthesis space, deep speech for speech recognition, and huge language models for natural language understanding like BERT, word to vec and GP23. And those algorithms are a step change again. For example, in speech recognition, deep speech uses what we call an end-to-end -end process. It doesn't need to use an acoustic model or library of sounds and match them to a dictionary or language model that contain a list of phonemes, the way that Sphinx or Caldi or Julius worked. Instead, deep speech uses a sequence to sequence approach. It uses deep learning to guess the specific letters that someone is saying. And this means that it's much more generalizable to other languages. 
On the speech synthesis side, WaveNet and Tachytron take a different approach to previous algorithms. Instead of using a concatenative approach where the sounds are stitched together, they use what we call a generative model, using deep learning to generate sounds that they've been trained on. So they're trained on a person's voice and then they're able to reproduce audio in the style of that person's speech. And implementing these algorithms has been facilitated by more mature tool chains, tools like TensorFlow, CRASS, PyTorch, and the large data sets on which to train speech recognition are more available. For example, the Libra speech open data set is often used as the basis for English language speech recognition models, but it's only a thousand hours of speech, not the tens of thousands of hours that are required to train robust speech recognition. On the voice synthesis side, there isn't yet a go-to data set because it requires hundreds of hours from just one speaker. The advance of hardware is still a driver for voice. In the last decade, hardware to run speech recognition has scaled in two different directions. Cloud compute has become faster, allowing large vocabulary recognition models to recognize speech in a matter of milliseconds, <laughs> not the two or three minutes of the harpy. Embedded hardware has increased in computational power too, meaning that mobile devices and offline devices can still do speech recognition in near real time and often without reducing vocabulary significantly. So think of the PDP-10 and what you have in your pocket now with your mobile phone. So here's a summary of the different factors that have been drivers of voice technology over the last 60 years or so. It's taken a lot more than a summer as the earnest young men at Dartmouth had declared in 1956. It's taken over 60 of them to get us to this point. But today, voice technologies are ubiquitous. We find them in our mobile phones, as digital assistants, in our homes doing things like playing music or switching off the lights. Many of you today will have Siri or OK Google or Alexa in your homes. We find them in our cars, providing navigational directions. There are now children's toys, and pretty soon we'll be talking to our house, household appliances to operate them. We're becoming used to machine-generated voices that are almost indistinguishable from human voices. In fact, we even prefer some of them to the real thing. You've got to feel a bit sorry for human too here. So voice technologies today are a far cry from a shoebox that can recognise 16 words or a child's spelling toy with a metallic voice. In fact, estimates predict that by 2023, there'll be more than one voice assistant for every person on the planet. Our aspiration and speculation on talking with machines and our long history of progress to create the technologies to do so are not new. But voice has now gone to scale. We have more speech recognition, more voice synthesis, more natural language processing. Indeed, we've begun to fulfil the challenge laid down at Dartmouth to give over to computers the functions traditionally reserved for people. We have more voice, but is it enough? Well, plot twist. The answer is no. And that's because voice technology has scaled in very particular ways that constrain the choices we have in using this technology. This reduces our freedom and runs anathema to the values of both the Linux ConfAU community and the broader free and open source software movement. Let's take a look at how these freedoms are curtailed. Firstly, many of the open source voice projects on which open source voice technologies gained a foothold in the 90s and 2000s are in significant decline or abandoned altogether. The team behind CMU Sphinx has gone on to a commercial venture called Alpha Sapphire. Caldi hasn't had a key release since 2017 and is largely maintained by a single person. On the synthesis side, Vestbox hasn't had a major release since 2017. Espeak is in a better position. Turning to newer open source projects, DeepSpeech from Mozilla 
was originally incepted to support the organization's strategic push into the mobile space with Firefox Mobile. Because Mozilla is no longer pursuing a mobile strategy, deep speech is no longer key to the Mozilla stack and it's been transitioned to a community supported product. What this decline means is that there are fewer options to choose from if embarking on a project that requires voice technology. This steers people into the direction of proprietary commercial offerings. Not only are many open source voice product projects in decline, the newer crop that has emerged are quite fragmented. For example, there are over a dozen open source voice assistants around. Just a few are shown on this slide. Voice assistants are assemblages. They combine many different types of voice technologies, such as speech recognition, voice synthesis, and natural language processing to allow people to issue spoken queries or commands. And they're struggling to gain traction in the market for a few reasons. They're dependent on their open source communities to build out a, a lot of functionality and skills and what they end up doing is competing for the same pool of open source developers, those with the time, talent and inclination to donate their skills for free. They're also at the mercy of content providers and API providers who have the power to dictate which channels their content can be accessed through. For example, Spotify recently changed their terms of service so that voice assistants were excluded from access via their API. As a consequence, the Spotify skill for Mycroft no longer works. Because they don't command large market share, they don't have influence in the market. This reinforces the power and dominance of proprietary players. It's exactly the issue Corey Doctorow was pointing to yesterday in his keynote, in his excellent keynote. And they all struggle with sustainable funding models and business models. Mycroft, for example, went down the crowdfunding route with mixed success, while the Armand project was successful in obtaining a grant from both the National Science Foundation and the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Others tend to rely on sponsorship and donation in what's an already crowded market. This again reinforces the power and dominance of proprietary players because they have a much longer runway to work with they can better absorb the, and offset the costs of research and development. And again, this echoes Cory Doctorow's argument from yesterday, they can buy their way to dominance. For open source projects that are able to maintain currency and momentum, and that have some sort of funding source or significant community contributions, they're faced with another choice limiting barrier. Voice technologies that use deep learning need to be trained on huge volumes of voice data. For example, for a very, very basic speech recognition model, something that's going to be able to recognize a few dozen words, you're going to need over a thousand hours of spoken audio matched with written phrases. If you want to build a larger speech recognition model with a more extensive vocabulary, then you'll need tens of thousands of hours of validated audio data. Only large companies, the key players, have the resources and the platforms such as voice assistants already installed in people's homes or in people's mobile devices to be able to collect this volume of voice data. And of course, it's proprietary. They're not going to make that voice data available for others to use. And this leads to yet another limitation of choice. Because proprietary voice technology providers are profit-driven, they're commercial companies, they're generally motivated to pursue development of language support that correlates with affluent geographies, geographies that have high GDP, that have high disposable income, that they can shepherd to e-commerce sites or to paid voice search results, geographies that will yield a return on investment. The slide doesn't show it, but the languages that are supported here are generally in affluent geographies. Languages in Africa and India are not as well supported. Many of these countries don't have strong internet or mobile coverage, and so they don't make for attractive markets in which to sell voice assistants, which are then used to collect a lot of speech recognition data. 
The irony is that voice technologies may have a huge role to play in the economic development of these countries because they often have low rates of literacy, meaning people often can't use traditional mobile phone apps, for example, to get agricultural information or public health information. Speaking to an app is a much more natural interface. And even if you do live in an affluent country and speak a language that is considered attractive to a commercial voice provider, you may not speak that language with an accent that is recognised well by voice technologies. Remember Sheridan and his attempts to standardise pronunciation early in the talk? Even today, accent has a huge bearing on how well a voice is recognised. For example, in a recent study by Alison Konake and her colleagues at Stanford, they found that African-American users of voice assistants in America and affluent geography are much less likely to be accurately recognised. A lack of open source voice technology doesn't just limit our choice in what languages are supported, it limits our choice in who gets to be recognised in a supported language. So how can we change the situation? Can we make voice technology and voice data sets be a public good? That is a, a resource which is non-rivalrous. It's not used up because many people consume it and non-excludable, meaning that everyone has access to it. Well, yes and no. Firstly, by making voice data sets a public good, existing commercial companies are able to use them to reinforce their already strong position new companies can start up and use the data for paid services and there's no obligation to contribute back to the data set. But if we make voice data sets paid access, then communities across the world who can least afford to pay and who are already underserviced by commercial voice companies will be locked out of participating. Secondly, the key actors who can make this aspiration a reality are governments who usually shepherd the, the use of public good resources. Most governments are currently dealing with the coronavirus public health crisis and the economic devastation that's being wrought in its wake. They don't have the capacity to take this on. Instead, what is emerging is that there are networks of like-minded organisations, philanthropic organisations, local technology associations and international development organisations, NGOs, who have recognised the value of open source voice tools as building blocks on which to build high utility applications. Networks and ecosystems have the ability to pull together the fragmentation that we're seeing in some areas, working together for a common goal. As Corey Doctorow said yesterday, we have allies everywhere. A key example of this in practice was the recent work undertaken by GIZ, the German Government International Development Agency and Mozilla, working with Digital Umuganda and a number of other partners on the ground in Rwanda. The project delivered the world's first speech recognition model in Kenya, Rwanda, a language spoken by over 12 million people in Rwanda one of the poorest countries in the world. Because the model is open source, it can now be used as a building block to deliver services to a cohort ravaged by civil war, economic underdevelopment, and now a public health crisis. The Kenya Rwanda project was facilitated by a data commons called Common Voice run by Mozilla. As a platform, it allows voice donors to provide snippets of their voice that collectively can be used to train speech recognition models. As a data commons, common voice is free for anyone to download, to build speech recognition models from, and to create new building blocks in new languages. It's a platform for everyone, a platform for choice. So next time you speak to Siri or Alexa or Google, please consider also donating your voice to common voice and in doing so, help to create a shared resource for public good, not for private benefit, a resource for everyone. In conclusion, this talk has provided some key milestones and markers on the journey of voice technologies and the various threads such as algorithms, hardware and data that have converged to create a situation where we have more voice, 
But due to the way in which that technology has scaled, we're now faced with a situation of less choice. For a moment, I'd like to take us back to the starting point of this talk at Dartmouth in 1956, where a goal was laid down, an aspirational direction was set for making machines use language. It's time for a new goal, a new aspiration. We need more choice, not just more voice. It's time to build voice technology for everyone, everywhere, in every language. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, you. Kathy. That was educational and inspirational. My pleasure. Um, so we do have time for questions. We have uh we we have about seven eight minutes for questions i believe so anyone if you have questions please type them in the chat the word question in front so we know where to find it and pass it on to kathy uh in the meantime while we're waiting for audience questions to come in kathy uh, i've been trying to think of a question and <laughs> i'm not very good at coming up with questions on the spot so i'm going to ask you the wonderful but terrible question of since since you ended looking forward where do you think this space might be in five ten years time and where do you hope it might be oh what a great question that's that, that's an excellent question betsy where i think this is going in the next five to ten years uh, i'm a little bit of a cynic a little bit of a pessimist at heart uh, i think we're going to see further consolidation of the voice space we're going to see larger players enter into the voice space. We're going to see the merging of people who have uh, software expertise with people who have data expertise. But again, that's going to be a consolidation uh, in the key players market. So the slide that uh, I showed that has the blue circles and the yellow circles, I think that the yellow circles are going to get better, bigger. And I think those blue circles are going to struggle to get larger. What I would like to see happen is governments realizing just how little choice they're left with and how little choice their peoples are left with when it comes to voice technology. For example, there is absolutely no commercial benefit in developing voice recognition or speech recognition for speakers of languages where that cohort is very, very small. For example, in Australia, uh, if I take Central Australia where the Walpuri Indigenous language is spoken, or if I look at the top end uh, where Yongnumata is spoken, there are thousands of speakers of those languages, not millions. And if we truly want an Australia that embraces all Australians, then I think governments have a responsibility to think about how the technologies they're building reach all of their citizens. Uh, so I think governments need to take on some responsibility. And I'm hopeful that now that the United Nations has declared the uh, 20 2022 to 2031, I think, as the decade of Indigenous languages, I'm hopeful that we'll see some movement in that space. What I'm also hopeful for, at the moment, some of the technologies like deep speech and algorithms like WaveNet and Tacatron, although the algorithms are open source, implementing those algorithms is very difficult technically. You know, you need a PhD in machine learning or linguistics to be able to do it or, you know, both. Um, so what I would like open source communities to focus on is making it easier and more accessible for those tools to be to be used so that we can get those tools and those utilities into the hands of more people. Uh, so I think that's uh, that's where I think uh, the sector is headed. But I'm also hopeful that there are interventions we can make to take that sector in a slightly different direction. That, that sounds like a wonderful future, that latter one. Um, let's hope we get there. We have a pile of audience questions coming in now and about Excellent. four minutes to get through them. Uh, don't rush, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do what we can. The first question is, what Australian efforts are you aware of? Ah, excellent question. Uh, so the prime mover of speech recognition in Australia is a research group called the Centre of Excellence for Dynamic Languages. 
they're headquartered out of the University of Queensland, but they also have a significant presence at ANU, here at ANU in the School of Linguistics. They have developed two uh, outstanding pieces of software. I hope I can remember their names correctly. One is Elpis and one is Persephone, and they help with something called the, uh, the transcription bottleneck problem. In order to build speech recognition models, you need both uh, what we call an orthographic corpus, a written set of phrases, as well as the audio that matches those. One of the hardest things in building out that data set, building out those corpora, are being able to transcribe the audio with, uh, with written phrases, so taking the audio and writing out the phrase. Those tools are going to hopefully uh, help address the uh, the transcription bottleneck. And a key researcher in this space is someone I have a lot of respect for. That's Ben Foley. Uh, so that's the key effort that I'm aware of in Australia. Thanks. Uh, the next question is, are there any voice assistants prepared for bilingual users that switch between languages in a single sentence or borrow words from another language periodically? OK. So, first of all, great question. Uh, that's two different types of questions. Uh, so, the first problem we have is what we uh, is the dual language problem. So, at the moment, you have to configure a voice assistant to to expect a priori to expect what language you're going to be speaking. At the moment, we don't have very good language recognition on the fly. Uh, so what I'm expecting to happen, and I think the time horizon for this is probably only going to be three or four years, I'm expecting voice assistants to be able to hear a stream of incoming audio and be able to categorise or classify the language of that incoming audio. So it's not here yet. Uh, I suspect we're very close and that we'll see that in the next couple of years. The second question is a slightly different type of problem, and that's related to something in linguistics called code switching. So, for example, if I speak English, <laughs> but uh, I may have uh, Scots heritage, I might start dropping words from Scots or Northumbrian into English speech. Uh, how do we? Uh, so if you have a speech recognition that model that's only trained on a particular language, it may not recognise loan words or code switching coming from other languages. For a lot of languages, for example, Kiswahili in Africa, uh, French, Indonesian, even Japanese, you have a lot of loan words coming in from other languages. What you have to do as part of your speech recognition process is do fine tuning to be able to recognise those loan words from other languages. So two separate problems and two separate approaches. Thanks for such a thorough answer, Cathy. Um, we've got about one minute left, so we'll fit in one more question. Um, <laughs> apart from Common Voice, which is a great project, what is the most promising open source project or collaboration for voice recognition in the space? Okay, so Common Voice is the data set. Common Voice is, uh, think of Common Voice as the inputs, the food for speech recognition engines. I still think that uh, Caldi has a lot of uh, a lot of credence and a lot of strength in the market, and I also think Deep Speech has a lot going for it as an implementation of a sequence to sequence algorithm. What I think the drawback for Deep Speech is, and, and keep in mind I'm a Mozilla employee, uh, Deep Speech at the moment is hard to use, and we need to work on making Deep Speech easier to use. We need something like a Deep Speech playbook. That makes sense. All right, we are at time. So there were quite a few questions left in the queue, Kathy. Um, do you want to um, answer questions in the text chat after we close up? Do you have time tonight? I would tonight? be absolutely delighted, Betsy. I, I could talk about this for hours. <laughs> Great. Um, so in just a minute, everyone, after we close up, you can head over to the Tux Theatre post-conference Q&A channel. If you haven't found it before, um, in Venulus, where you're watching now, go to the um, sidebar on the left and go to click the like more channels or the little compass and find Tux Theatre post-chat Q&A. And we'll send Kathy your way there shortly. Kathy, I'd just like to thank you again for such an absolutely fantastic talk. Um, and I want to particularly single out how amazing and professional your delivery is and your recovery from that glitch earlier. Uh, everybody in the chat will agree with me. You did the best.